Hello, everyone, and welcome to my channel. I am very happy to have you here once again. And today, with this video, we will introduce uh, one of my books, namely the book uh, Eurasianism, an Ideology for the Multipolar World. This book has been published in 2020 by the American publishing house Lexington. And uh, uh, you can find it uh, on in the link that I have posted underneath this video. Uh, the book comes with an introduction with a foreword by Professor Slobodchikov uh, from the University of Troy. And today I will uh, introduce you the main topics, research question, or best to say research questions, and reasons why I decided to pursue this, uh, this research. Um, well, first of all, let's try to understand what is the topic of the research. Uh, as we said, this research is focused on the study of Eurasianism. Now, Eurasianism is, first of all, an ideology. In this sense, it's a political doctrine but even more importantly, it's a geopolitical doctrine. It's a geopolitical doctrine that is somehow still cryptic for the Western audience. By Western, I mean European and American. Uh, however, it has been present in the political intellectual debate of some Eurasian countries, and of course, Russia, but not only Russia, uh, it has been present also in Kazakhstan, uh, in Iran, in Turkey, uh, for almost one century. And um, but why trying to uh, analyze this topic and this specific ideology? Well, let's say that the initial idea came from the study of uh, Halford Mackinder's geopolitical thought. Uh, Sir Halford Mackinder was a very famous geopolitician, one of the founding fathers of the discipline of geopolitics. He was a British geographer, but also academic, explorer, uh, writer, and so on. And basically, his main idea, his main argument, geopolitical argument, was that the international power that would gain the control over the Eurasian landmass would eventually become the world hegemon. Now, of course, Mackinder writes and speaks in the first half of the 20th century. His Hartland theory, the original um, theorization of the Hartland theory dates back to 1904. Uh, however, we must, we must understand that he was speaking from the perspective of the British Empire. And so he understood through his uh, geopolitical thought that um, Great Britain would be at stake if a pan-continental Eurasian state would rise. We will see better how this was possible and why all of a sudden this fear. But of course, at the time, Mackinder was thinking either of a, a German rise in Eurasia or a Russian rise in Eurasia, or even worse, let's say a German-Russian condominium uh, on the landmass. This potential Eurasian empire would embody a mortal threat to so-called maritime or thalassocratic powers, like Great Britain, the British Empire of the time, but also the United States later, because it put, put at stake basically international law, sovereignty, international trade, and also, of course, the strategic interests, the lines of communication of uh, the British Empire with its um, 
Indian and East Asian assets. But McKinder specifically stated that who controlled Eastern Europe would control the heartland, that is the Eurasian core. In turn, who controlled the heartland would control the world island, that is Eurasia. And world island is the name that McKinder uses to describe the Eurasian continent. And finally, who controlled Eurasia would control the rest of the world for several reasons. We will see this later. Uh, so actually, although Mackinder wrote this at the beginning of the 20th century, as we said, what is quite impressive is the fact that uh, throughout modern history, the strategic interest in ruling Eurasia does not seem to have changed. Because what I noticed through my research is that the control of the Eurasian landmass has been somehow a, a constant objective, a light motive that different powers, or at least at different powers that had the will to become hegemon, have shared. Uh, if we analyze history, we can see that since the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789, there have been at least four major events uh, that almost reached all of them, the objective of unifying Eurasia under a single rule. First of all, we had uh, Napoleon's invasion of first of Central Europe, the Germanic space, and then the Russian Empire. Then we had the attempt by uh, Wilhelmine Germany, by Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, his intervention in World War I against France and Russia. Then we had, of course, the intervention by Hitler in, uh, in, in World War II with uh, Operation Barbarossa, this eastward expansion and invasion of the Soviet Union. And then the fourth attempt was the Soviet enlargement and the dominion in Eastern Europe after World War II, which was counterbalanced by the uh, birth of NATO and the attempt to marginalize the Soviet Union within the heartland of the Eurasian continent, avoiding it to reach the marginal rims of the, of the continent. And what is interesting is that all these attempts, all four, uh, were contrasted and averted by direct or indirect interventions of the so-called sea powers. First, Great Britain, that countered Napoleon, and then uh, German attempts, the two German attempts, and then later the United States, that instead tried to counter the uh, Soviet expansion. And so my question was, uh, within this frame, can we affirm that the effort to rule the key strategic zones of Eurasia uh, represents a continual goal that uh, powers in search of uh, global hegemony pursue? This was one of the main questions that I tried to address throughout this, uh, this research. In other words, what I try to answer is uh, uh, the question whether it is just a random occurrence that uh, different powers struggle uh, for controlling the same regions in this macro space, this Eurasian macro space that goes from Eastern Europe to Russia uh, slash Eurasia, uh, or is there a precise strategic intention behind this behavior. And after uh, this research, I must admit that my answer would be closer to the latter explanation. Then the second element, of course, that uh, interests me was actually analyzing Spikeman's geopolitical theory. Nicholas Spikeman is another geopolitician, a very famous one, Dutch American, who basically um, developed and fostered McKinder's geopolitical thought 
in producing the so-called theory of the Rimland, which to some extent represents a corollary of Mackinder's Hartland theory, but from the opposite perspective. Because whereas Mackinder believed that the power who controlled the, the Hartland would control eventually Eurasia, Spikeman believed the exact opposite, arguing that who controlled the Eurasian peripheral zones, uh, that is, the, that rim that spreads from Western Europe to the Korean Peninsula uh, through to the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and Indochina, that power would instead rule Eurasia and thus the world. And the empirical evidence, the empirical evidence behind this theory would be implicit in, for instance, the containment strategy that the United States promoted against the Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War, especially during the early years of the Cold War with under Truman's presidency to avoid a deeper penetration of the Soviet Union in the Eurasian rims, for instance, in Germany, but also in Greece, Turkey, in the Middle East, in Indochina, in Korea, and so on. And finally, the third geopolitical author that triggered my, my, my uh, interest triggered in a good way, like that made me really be passionate about the geopolitical theories uh, was Karl Haushofer. Now, Karl Haushofer was a German geopolitical thinker who belonged to the Munich school of geopolitical thought. As such, he was um, one of the official geopoliticians of Nazi Germany. And his uh, commitments towards um, Germany led him to theorize interesting geopolitical uh, theories. He, of course, followed the same postulates that McKinder uh, stated about Eurasia's strategic relevance. And one of his main theorizations was actually the idea of creating a so-called continental bloc a Eurasian continental bloc, which would have comprised um, uh, Germany, Russia, and Japan in opposition to the British Empire, to the Thalassocratic British Empire. And actually, this project of continental bloc was one of the main vectors that led Germany uh, to sign the non aggression pact. Uh, with the Soviet Union, the so-called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, and also the, the main vector that contributed in promoting the idea of making the USSR a member of the Tripartite Pact. And so this, as much as uh, geopol geopolitics is concerned, then, of course, there were other reasons why I wanted to carry out this research. Uh, and one was that I soon discovered that basically the term Eurasia bore a specific importance as a strategic but also philosophical concept, especially for this doctrine known as Eurasianism, which combines philosophical, political, and strategic ideas. So while uh, analyzing uh, Eurasianism and geopolitics, I discovered uh, a very controversial but charismatic person, academic, who represents one of the major exponents of contemporary Eurasianism, namely Alexander Dugin, who is often linked to the Russian far right. And allegedly would have contributed in shaping Vladimir Putin's uh, foreign policy choices. Uh, and of course, Dugin's thought, albeit extremely eclectic, dogmatic, sometimes cryptic, and not necessarily always uh, understandable, 
uh, offers indeed today a, a very well, a very good possibility to explain and understand the Eurasianist ideology. So basically the very aim of this research, and here we arrive to the, to the core of the matter, is to investigate what kind of ideology Eurasianism is, and it's also to clarify what can be considered its main goals and objectives. As we will see, Eurasianism possesses many characteristics that ideologies share, including a normative, dogmatic, and subjective narrative, which is not necessarily supported by empirical evidence. Uh, and then within this general frame, specifically the research would like to investigate Alexander Dugin's new Eurasianist ideology and its consequences and outcomes, both at a domestic level, as Dugin would like to structure the state, and also in terms of international relations. So what kind of international system Dugin would like to support and promote. And of course, another important uh, aim of the research is to explore the geopolitical schemes and theorizations that underlined, underline a specific strategic importance of the Eurasian continent, particularly Mackinder's Heartland theory. And from a point of view of international relations, the research will try to depict and understand what kind of international order Eurasianism would like to establish, and namely an order based on the principles of multipolarity, of civilizational blocks, and of alter globalism. So the main hypotheses that the research assesses are uh, mainly three. First, whether the Eurasianist ideology and specifically Alexander Dugin's neo-Eurasianism would represent an effective theoretical contribution for the description of the advent of the multipolar international order, or instead would it embody an inefficient and normatively biased or naive hermeneutic instrument? The second hypothesis is whether geopolitical theories could still offer a valid tool for interpreting and understanding international relations and global power. And third, whether Eurasia could be considered a truly strategic continent for global hegemony, despite the uh, evolution of technology, despite the advent of the so-called uh, global village, the so-called globalization, and so on. Now, let's say that Russian Eurasianism can be considered a conservative political ideology. So first of all, we have to understand that we are in the realm of conservatism. Uh, it is grounded on the principles of uh, traditionalism, on a geopolitical narrative, and on the idea that actually Russia as a conservative country would bear a, speci a specific historical mission aimed at counterbalancing liberalism and modernism. One of the basic assumptions of Eurasianism is that Russia bears uh, neither a European nor an Asian character, but it's rather a unique country that blends characteristics of both Europe and Asia. Uh, Eurasianism also claims that Russia bears two imperial heritages. Uh, on one hand, the heritage of the nomadic empires of the Eurasian steppes and specifically of Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire. And on the other hand, the heritage of the Byzantine Empire, which is expressed in the myth of Moscow as Third Rome. And as a, as a philosophical movement, Eurasianism was conceived by those Russian intellectual emigre who had fled the country after the advent of the Bolshevik rule in 1917 and later reappeared in its contemporary guise after the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991. 
Sometimes the Slavophile movement is considered a predecessor of uh, Eurasianism uh, because it also rejected Westernization and believed in specific Russian cultural identity. However, there are several main differences between Eurasianism and Slavo Slavophilism, uh, mainly the idea that the Slavic element is not the distinguishing feature of Russian identity, according to Eurasianists, which instead believe in the synthesis between the Slavic and Turanian Ural Altaic component of the Russian identity. Uh, Eurasianists believe that the cultures of the Turanian peoples were closer to Russian culture compared with, for instance, with the cultures of West Western Slavs, so Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and so on. And of course, the Eurasianists also rejected Pan-Slavism and the political project aimed at integrating in a single country all Slavic nations at the expense of Turkic and Ural-Altaic and ugro elements. Instead, the Eurasianists believe in the creation of a Eurasian empire that included different nations and ethnic groups that shared, however, a common civilizational model. These included Eastern Slavs, Finno Greeks, Turkic peoples, Caucasians, Mongols, and so on. And so the idea of creating this Eurasian empire is closely linked to the idea of Turanism. In other videos, I will describe more in depth what Turanism is, also following other publications that I that I made on, on Turanism on this subject. The word Turanism, however, we can say that comes from the word Turan, which is an historical region located in Central Asia, often opposed to Iran as a civilizational concept. And to basically as an ideology, Turanism, also called Panturanism, uh, is a 19th century ideology, which was theorized by some Turkish, Hungarian, but also German and Ottoman intellectuals aimed at promoting the union and collaboration and renaissance of all Turanian peoples, including Finns, Japanese, Koreans, Turks, Mongols, Manchus, Sami, uh, Samoyeds, Magyars, and so on. One of the key figures of classic Eurasianism was, of course, Prince uh, Nikolai Trubetskoy, I introduce in the book this, this figure. He was the first Eurasianist to proclaim in 1925 that Russia was not the successor of Kiev and Rus, but rather of Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire. And in Trubetskoy's mindset, uh, Russians and Turanic nomads would share a common cultural background based on personal devotion, political obedience, heroism, and spiritual hierarchy. And this values would be antithetic and uh, incompatible with uh, Western European liberalism and commercialism. Uh, thus, Eurasianism would represent an antithesis of uh, Westernism. And after the Bolshevik Revolution, though condemning its atheistic and Marxist connotation, the, the Eurasianists still viewed uh, uh, the revolution as a Eurasian project of resistance against westernization. In other words, the pride of its atheistic and Marxist ideology, the Soviet Union would represent for Eurasianists the perfect example of Turanian empire. Uh, today, uh, as far as neo-Eurasianism is concerned, we can say that there are four main interpretations, four broad interpretations, especially in the, in, in the Russian uh, cultural environment. Uh, the first is the far right interpretation, which is advocated by Dugin and uh, perceives Eurasianism as both a global campaign against Western rebel democratic values and a tool for new imperial regional integration centered on Russia. Then there is a more moderate view uh, which conceives Eurasianism as a Russian instrument to reassert its international role, pivoting on the analysis of institutional processes of Eurasian integration, uh, 
like for instance, the uh, project of the Eurasian Economic Union. There is also a liberal strand of Eurasianism that rejects the nationalist and chauvinist rhetoric in favor instead of pragmatic understanding of the relations that connect the Eurasian continent with the rest of the world. And finally, there is also a non-Russian Eurasianist approach, which is promoted by some countries like Kazakhstan, Turkey, and Iran, which adopts a unique interpretation of the phenomenon. However, and this is important to highlight, this specific research will specifically uh, underline the main assumptions of the far-right Eurasianist interpretation as conceived by Alexander Dugin. Mm -hmm. Having so said, we can say that the uh, research is divided in um, seven main chapters. And let's very quickly analyze the key elements of all. So the first chapter analyzes the concept of ideology because before understanding what Eurasianism is, I believed it necessary to conceptualize the concept of ideology. Sorry for the tautology. Uh, and then understanding how ideology can be divided. And then with this, within this general um, taxonomy, if we want, understand where to put uh, Eurasianism. So in this sense, the first chapter is methodological and understands ideologies as a tool for analyzing Eurasianism. In other words, since Eurasianism is an ideology, the chapter believes useful to understand how and why ideologies develop and what their main characteristics are. It is difficult and controversial to define the concept of ideology. Uh, as a word, ideology appeared for the first time in France at the end of the 18th century, and at the time was used to describe a new science aimed at studying the origins of ideas. At the time, ideology was um, considered a science that studied the faculties of thinking, judging, remembering, and wishing in relation to the formation, origin, character, meaning, and significance of ideas. However, this idea, uh, this very word, ideology, was soon accused of describing a doctrinal uh, an often abstract set of ideas that was in fact detached from reality. And one of the uh, critics of the, uh, the word ideology was actually Karl Marx, who assumed that an ideology represented per se a set of philosophical, ethical, political, and religious doctrines that would justify the relations of productions imposed by the dominant class. In this sense, ideology was an instrument, a tool used by the exploiters to uh, exploit the lower classes. And during the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, the word ideology and the concept of ideology became one of the essential subjects uh, investigated both by sociology and political science. Uh, although its intrinsic scientific validity was often questioned. And while being assimilated by sociology, uh, the very concept of ideology gradually turned into a generic term, which was applicable to any political doctrine or social movement supported by a theoretical frame, and even to specific cultural, political, economic, and social inclinations. For instance, authors uh, like Giovanni Sartori or uh, Karl Popper accused ideology of contrasting with the scientific method and in this sense accused it of not being supported by empiricism and empirical evidence. In the last decades, many scholars of political theory and political science have attempted to offer a definition of the concept of ideology which however still remains a rather ambiguous notion. And in this book, I attempt to give a minimal definition despite promoting and presenting um, a literature review on the word. Uh, 
as a minimal definition, I define it, uh, I define ideology as a set of beliefs, opinions, values, and norms that guide a specific social group. Of course, ideologies can be analyzed in relation to many variables. For instance, in relation to the location of their action, to their role, social role, to the subject that created them, to their position in society, their functions, their goals, their structure, and so on. And also ideologies can be classified in many ways. Uh, however, we can generally speaking, broadly speaking, uh, classify and divide ideologies into seven main groups from which, I'm sorry, maybe to oversimplify, from which all others stem. And these groups are liberalism, conservatism, socialism, anarchism, communism, nationalism, and fascism. Now, what are the key aspects of these seven ideologies, of the seven macro ideologies? Well, first of all, liberalism hinges on the autonomous and self-sufficient value of the individual, and it promotes a society in which state interventionism is minimal. Instead, conservatism is an ideology that opposes revolutionary projects and radical changes, radical social changes, upholding instead the need to maintain the social political status quo. At the same time, socialism focuses on the necessity to suppress social privileges and to promote total equality among social members. Uh, moreover, Anarchism promotes the abolition of any kind of government and of the state itself that uh, imposes its rule over individuals, supporting, of course, the idea of the abolition of any political uh, and um, of any political apparatus and institution. Communism endorses a social system in which private property is abolished the means of productions are collectivized and managed by the entire society and also economic policies are rigidly planned by a central organization now paradoxically the entire society usually do not actually manage the means of productions which instead are managed by um, the only allowed political party namely the communist party then nationalism promotes the exaltation and defense of the nation as a spiritual concept, sometimes also as a racial concept, ethno-political concept, and nation, the nation, the idea of nation is considered the chief social value. And finally, fascism is a political movement that combines some elements of the socialist doctrine with a chauvinist, jingoist, ultra-nationalist ideology, uh, blending collectivism with uh, the idolatry, if we want, of the state. From uh, a methodological perspective, Eurasianism can be considered a full-fledged ideology because, as I have shown in this first chapter, it presents many of the elements that are typically characteristic of ideology and within this division, it uh, epitomizes a strand of conservatism. It is not fascism, it is not uh, socialism, it is not communism, it is actually a form of conservatism. And But what does conservatism mean? Well, first of all, conservatism describes any political philosophy that supports tradition in its various representations both at a religious level, at the cultural level, at an identity level, at a creed, at the level of creeds and customs, and so on. And so in this sense, conservatism contrasts all those thrusts that encourage and support radical change, radical political and social change, namely revolutions, uh, upheavals, and uh, radical reforms, reforms that are uh, introduced in a radical way. And in this, in this perspective, some expressions of conservatism tend to preserve the status quo of society or uh, 
at the least reform society in a very slow way, while others instead seek to return to the principles of earlier times, the so-called golden age. And generally speaking, conservatism has its own antagonists, namely liberalism, socialism, and fascism. Why? Because these ideologies are perceived by conservatism as too progressive or revolutionary. However, uh, conservatism usually belongs to the right-wing political spectrum. The main adversary of conservatism is represented by all forms of radicalism that demand a process of change and that actually question traditional institutions. Radicalism in all its aspects implies a radical change, and this is incompatible with the principles of conservatism. From an historical point of view, the political use of the term conservatism appeared after the French Revolution, and it was mainly theorized by the famous philosopher Edmund Burke, who is actually considered the intellectual father of conservatism. And uh, uh, in turn, conservatism can be divided into several main sub-branches and strands. We can quote cultural conservatism, social conservatism, religious conservatism, fiscal conservatism, bio-conservatism, neo-conservatism, paleo-conservatism, and so on. We will analyze them more deeply in the coming, in the coming uh, meetings. So uh, within this frame and within this general in this general conceptual framework, we can say that Eurasianism can be considered a conservative ideology that includes cultural, social, religious, religious, and biological aspects of conservatism. Uh, however, uh, Eurasianism does not revolve around the need to maintain the contemporary status quo against progressivism, but instead it wishes to replace current societies especially uh, the so-called post-liberal ones, with societies based on traditionalism. Uh, and uh, practically speaking, Eurasianism sponsors a worldwide revolution of a conservative nature that would accomplish the goals of introducing traditional societies. Uh, in this sense, given the revolutionary action that it endorses, because it actually advocates a revolution, it is somewhat unclear whether Eurasianism may be considered a pure conservative ideology or maybe a hybrid version of a conservative ideology. Uh, and moreover, Eurasianism is a typical strand of post-Soviet conservatism that underscores ultra-globalism, civilizational identitarism, religious heritage, anti-liberalism, anti-communism, anti-racism, uh, traditional order, geopolitical analysis, and finally, historical discourse and historical, let's say, uh, consciousness, historical and civilizational consciousness. Within this general, Within this general frame, we can say that specifically Dugin's neo Eurasianism represents one of the last manifestations of Russian political thought of the 20th century. We know that this political thought is the result of traumatic events that Russians lived throughout the 20th century that has contributed to shape Russia's philosophical mindset. These events were various. The first one was, of course, the fall of the Tsarist regime and uh, the Bolshevik advent to power in 1917, which represented a total shift in Russia's ideological paradigm. The second event was, of course, the witness of Stalin's horrible persecutions and purges, and which spread, of course, terror and hopelessness in the minds of the people. And the third event was another traumatic uh, event, of course, the, 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 namely the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany in 1941 with Operation Barbarossa, and actually the barbarization of the Second World War, which turned into an ideological total struggle for the survival of fascism or communism 
And finally, the last event was the sudden demise of the Soviet state and the introduction, introduction in Russia of uh, alien liberal reforms through uh, shock therapies in 1991, the coming years. And so the collapse of the Soviet Union basically generated for the first time the awareness of a downsizing of the importance of Russia in, in the international environment and it's the classing from international superpower to second rank state and after 1991 like many other socialist states russia was confronted with two alternatives on the one hand there was the possibility to embrace the idea of the end of history as theorized by francis fukuyama uh, which would have implied the adoption of the values and principles of the liberal democratic West. On the other hand, the other possibility was to look back to Russian history and culture and to search in this framework for elements that could offer a characteristic alternative Russian identity, erasing perhaps the memory of the Soviet experience but nonetheless, looking back to the Tsarist imperial epoch to try to find some elements uh, of uh, sustainability. And in this context, intellectual currents, intellectual ideologies appeared, pivoting on the theme of Russia's historical uniqueness uh, as a state bridging Europe and Asia with a tradition of solid centralized power and imperial mission. And among these currents were, were of course, was of course uh, neo-Eurasianism. When President Putin came into power, uh, Russian political thought witnessed a renewal of the ideological component compared to Yeltsin's era, with a stronger focus on nationalism, patriotism, neo-imperialism, the idea of prestige, and the pursuit of national interest. And specifically since 2008, which you may remember marks the year of Russian intervention in Georgia, uh, Russia developed a markedly neo-imperialist character based more on the values of conservatism, of uh, statism, and also alter globalism. And conservatism is often used as an ideological justification to support Russian interests in the post-Soviet area or even to challenge the uh, unipolar contemporary world order. Um, and so this thrust, uh, the Eurasianist thrust uh, of President Putin's um, leadership can be seen, for instance, in the Eurasian integration initiatives like, for instance, the creation of the Eurasian Economic Union and the idea of reasserting um, Russian influence in uh, many key countries of the post-Soviet space. So this, as much as the first chapter is, in, is concerned. The second chapter instead represents a historical and philosophical account that describes the evolution of the Eurasianist doctrine from early, or also called classic Eurasianism, to Neo-Eurasianism, so it embraces a century of historical, basically, uh, excursus and tracing, and the main theoretical contributions that its advocates gave it. Uh, as seen, Eurasianism appeared as a social-political ideology founded by Russian emigre after the Bolshevik Revolution. And at the time, it mainly represented an intellectual movement with small political impact based on a somewhat nostalgic and romantic vision of the Russian Empire. And the foundational be beliefs that built the Eurasianist doctrine included the idea of uh, Russian unique identity, neither European nor Asian, but a, rather an exclusive blend that combined the two aspects of it. Uh, as well as the idea of the two imperial heritages that we have already analyzed. And also the idea of Russia's uh, need to contrast from a conservative point of view, the Western liberal mindset 
So a criticism towards the Western cultural model shaped on the so-called Romano-Germanic uh, civilization, which according to Eurasianism in the long term forged a social paradigm founded on individualism, egoism, uh, competition, social Darwinism, atheism, materialism, unrestricted technological progress, consumerism, and eco economic exploitation. And among the founding fathers of Eurasianism that will be analyzed in the book, we quote uh, Trubetskoy, Savitsky, Florovsky, Vernatsky, and Ilin. Then we consider the so-called interconnection between classic Eurasianism and Neo-Eurasianism, given especially by uh, Liev Gumilyov. Uh, Gumilyov's thought is based on Eurasianist idealism, also on the so-called passionarity theory, based on the idea that each ethnos, each people, which is considered a biological spontaneous formation, is influenced by cosmic energetic impulses that produce a special vital activity capable of forging new civilizations. Then, of course, uh, the chap the section dedicated to Gumilyov analyzes uh, the Gumilyov's theory of ethnogenesis, highlighting the importance of the creation of an ethnos in order to shape based on that ethnos a political society against uh, the overcome of historical ethnic identities. And finally, we will also analyze the study, Gumilyov's study of the proto-history and history of nomadic Eurasian empires founded by Turkic Mongol peoples, including Huns, Tatars, Bulgars, Mongols, and so on, showing the continuity between these statehoods and Russia. And finally, we will reach uh, the uh, contemporary debate on Eurasianism with the new Eurasianist interpretation. Uh, as we already anticipated, new Eurasianism was born at, at the end of the 1980s, uh, and especially after the demise of the Soviet Union. It appears as a, a doctrine that uh, rises after the reforms introduced by perestroika, with, which would, as we know, have ultimately led to the demise of the Soviet Union and to the introduction, the introduction of the Western liberal model in Russia during Yeltsin's presidency. And Eurasianism, from a doctrinal point of view, extended the range of early Eurasianism by combining it with new ideologies and methodologies including the idea of traditionalism, geopolitics, especially geopolitics is very important, but also the concepts of new right, new left, third way, the theory of the right of peoples above human rights, the idea of ecology, ruralism, eschatological messianism, uh, the idea of conservative revolution as enshrined also in German conservative revolution of the 1920s, uh, and the rebirth of spirituality. Uh, in neo eurasianism espouses the idea of rejection of the West, which it perceives as a deviant cultural model. Specifically, this repudiation refers to Atlanticism. Uh, we will understand in the, in the coming chapters what Atlanticism means. Uh, and in terms of philosophical history, neo eurasianism wishes to interpret history in the light of geographical determinism and civilizational relativism, referring to authors like uh, Danilievsky, Spengler, Toynbee, Gumilyov, and of course, Huntington. And in terms of its political platform, neo eurasianism is strongly influenced by, for instance, Wilfredo Pareto's elitist school, highlighting the relevance of elitist political doctrines based on, based on elitism, the role of the elite. Key elements of the neo eurasianist ideology also comprise the rehabilitation of hierarchy, the orthodox, Christian orthodox conception of power as kathechon, uh, the replacement of the idea of representative democracy with uh, that of organic, that is direct democracy, the so-called demotia, as also theorized by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, 
and the participation of the people in forging, of the peoples of the world in forging their destiny, and the fundamental call for a conservative revolution and for a third way in economics that, go, that goes beyond uh, capitalism and socialism. Now, the most influential new Eurasianists that will be scrutinized uh, in, this, in, this, in this book uh, are Alexander Panarin and above all, Alexander Dugin, originally a follower of national Bolshevism. Uh, Dugin believes in the political combination of the far right with the far left in the geopolitical dichotomy between uh, tellurocracy, that is uh, continental power expressed by Eurasianism and thalassocracy, that is sea power expressed by Atlanticism and then the foundation of a new conservative international system. Then in chapter three, we will try to describe the liaison that connects uh, Eurasianism with geopolitics. Uh, we already said that Eurasianism bases much of its discourse on geopolitical analysis and also in geopolitical narrative, if we want. In fact, the core subject of Eurasianism, as the name suggests, is of geographical, uh, is geographical in nature, it's Eurasia. Why? Because Eurasianisms, Eurasianists at attribute to Eurasia as a concept a strategic and geopolitical relevance. And of course, Dugan represents one of the main Eurasianist authors that analyzes the strategic weight of the Eurasian landmass, following the scheme of the contraposition between sea powers and land powers. That is a typical hermeneutical tool that geopolit geopolitics makes use of. Uh, however, of course, geopolitics may be considered a controversial tool to interpret international relations, since its validity is uh, uh, debatable, its narrative is sometimes normative and dogmatic. Uh, so the book also addresses this concern and this criticism on the actual validity of the geopolitical analysis to analyze the international system. Uh, but what is geopolitics? The chapter also tries to understand that geopolitics basically studies the relations between political power and geographical landscape. And it may be considered uh, the analysis of international relations from a spatial and geographic perspective aimed at underlining the strategic relevance of political and physical geography for the pursuit of international power. This as a definition. <coughs> Clearly, geopolitical theories tend to privilege the analysis of the geographical factor in the international system believing that basically geography represents one of the most stable elements of the international relations because it's it's always there and it's always the same despite the uh, passing of the years and of the centuries historically speaking geopolitics started to appear as an organic subject in the late 19th century we know that between 1890 and 1920, the discipline orbited around uh, the works of Alfred Mahan, a famous uh, American um, admiral, who focused, of course, his attention on sea power. Another author was Friedrich Ratzel, a German geopolitician who focused instead on the idea of living biological or organism, state as a biological organism. And then, of course, Halford McKinder, who focused on the threats originating from land power, especially in Eurasia. And the other author, the fourth, was Rudolf Kjellin, a Swedish political scientist who uh, introduced the idea of the subdivision of the world in pan-regional blocks, giving a theorization of the model of multipolarism. And, um, other authors who contributed significantly to the development of geopolitics have been Nicholas Spikeman, which, who was one of the great theorists of Atlanticism and of the strategy of containment against, uh, against uh, Soviet Russia, and then Karl Haushofer, who instead promoted the idea of continental bloc, this continental Eurasian bloc, to marginalize uh, sea power especially specifically at the time the British Empire. 
And of course, geopolitics has been subject to great criticism. One criticism refers to its overestimation of the geographical factor interpreting the reality of international relations. Um, there is the idea that today meta institutions like uh, international organizations, but also global governance would somewhat be uh, diluting the importance of states, of borders, and therefore also the importance of geography. In other words, the organizations like the United Nations or even the European Union, uh, but also international regimes and standards, uh, global networks, the role of civil society would be residing the role of the state as exclusive international actor. Um, some critics believe that international relations cannot be explained only referring to geopolitics while omitting important variables like domestic politics, economics, trade, political ideologies, the role of constructivist worldviews, but also religion, psychology, and so on. And finally, another critic uh, criticism refers to the idea that geopolitics has been considered ideologically keen to the promotion of expansionism, militarism, imperialism, and sometimes also uh, fascism. Um, However, Dugan builds his neo-Eurasianist doctrine upon geopolitical analysis, uh, which in his idea consists of three main elements, geography, culture, and history, and also national interest. And in this sense, Dugan's geopolitical narrative is aimed at creating a powerful unified polity under the hegemony of Russia in Euro-Asia and a German-French one in, uh, in Europe. Uh, claiming that this Eurasian empire will be fabricated on the rejection of Atlanticism and Western liberal values. Um, and considering geopolitics as a dogmatic ideology, Dugan uses, takes back those schemes that, comes, that come from classical geopolitics, like the scheme of the heartland, of the rimland, of the world island, to explain contemporary international events. Uh, it's not a chance that one of his last publications um, has uh, the title of the last war for the world island. So in this sense, of course, according to Dugin, NATO enlargement in the post-Soviet space is an Atlantis plan to expand in the Rimland for the benefit of sea power. Whereas for instance, a possible agreement between Germany and France for the creation of an independent European army would be instead step forward for the creation of a continental power that would advance that would, would put an advantage uh, continental power according to Dugin, the dichotomy between land power and sea power would have reached its uh, full maturation during the cold war where the two cultural political forms of marxism and liberalism control the heartland and the so-called outer crescent of the world island respectively and following mckinner's scheme which Dugan uses a lot, uh, he portrays the geopolitical map of the world in three zones. Uh, there is the inner continental Eurasian space, then the continental crescent, and finally the insular crescent, the outer crescent. Moreover, Dugan believes that Russia would bear a geopolitical manifest destiny, parallel to the manifest destiny of the United States. That is namely the unification of the Eurasian landmass and the replacement of Western liberal principles with conservative values. Finally, let's consider the, end, the last part of, the, of chapter three that analyzes the four possible outcomes of the geopolitical struggle between sea power and land power, according to Duke. One would be the victory of Thalassocracy, which would end the cycle of conflict between the two civilizations but would not spread its liberal democratic model upon the rest of the world, or the defeat of global telurocracy that occurred after the demise of the Soviet empire would be momentary because Eurasia would return to its pan-continental mission in a new form, or the victory of telurocracy that would found the international system on a civilizational model and enclose the cycle of, uh, of history. Or finally, the victory of Thalassocracy that would annihilate the civilization of Telerocracy. This uh, 
4, chapter 3. And then, starting from then, chapter 4, chapter 4, I believe to be one of the most important chapters of the book, because chapter 4, which is also the longest and the broadest in terms of concepts, is the chapter that introduces classical geopolitical theories that focus on the Eurasian continent. Specifically, this chapter investigates Halford McKinder's Heartland theory. Uh, the purpose of it is to show how the Heartland theory has deeply influenced Eurasianist thought by emphasizing the strategic importance of the Eurasian landmass for global hegemony. We know that from a geopolitical standpoint, Eurasia represents a strategic continental bloc created around Russia or its enlarged base, that is, post-Soviet states, in active or passive antagonism with the strategic initiatives of NATO or other US allies, for instance, in the Pacific, let's think Japan or Japan. Uh, and Mackinder, in this sense, is extremely useful for understanding the importance of Eurasia. First of all, the chapter analyzes one of the original um, descriptions of uh, geography according to the, to mckinder because in the, in the on the scopes and methods of geography in this article mckinder described how and why now we can really understand geopolitical and geographical uh, schemes because the world is now fully discovered and so it's a closed system from which we can really really uh, analyze from a global perspective from an overwhelming perspective, the um, events of the international system. So on the scopes and methods of geography is analyzed to give a general idea of Mackinder's geographical methodology. Then the chapter continues to analyze the main, the two main contributions to the theorization of the Hartland theory. First, the 1904 famous article, The Geographical Pivot of History, was published by the Royal Geographical Society. And then it's further uh, evolutions, especially the one in 1919 in the book, Democratic Ideals and Reality. Uh, and also the other one in 1943 during the Second World War. We will analyze, of course, more thoroughly the implications of this theory in the coming uh, meetings. So I, I will just, for the time being, I will just, uh, um, pause that that analysis. And at the same time, the chapter analyzes Carl Sofer, Carl Sofer's uh, understanding of the Hartmann theory for supporting German expansionism, an expansionism that is based on the same assumption that uh, McKinder theorized. Al Sofer basically had to change perspectives. So what Mackinder saw from the perspective of the British Empire, he wanted to see from the perspective of the German Empire and then German, Nazi Germany, which meant basically doing exactly the opposite of what Mackinder didn't want to happen. So the creation of a Eurasian Empire that put, put at stake British philosophy. And then of course, we will also analyze Nicholas Spikeman's theory of the Rimland, how it uh, counterbalances the Mackinder's Hartman theory, basing it from the opposite views of the importance of the outer of the inner crescent, also called Rimland, the Eurasian Rim, vis-a-vis -vis the Heartland. Then the book follows with three important chapters, five, uh, six, and seven, which are the chapters that investigate thoroughly the features of Dugin's new Eurasianist ideology. Well, the first one, chapter five, from the point of view of the ideology of the main of the core assumptions. The second one, from the points of from the point of view of the enemies and antagonists of Eurasianism, and the final one, from the point of view of the international order that New Eurasianism would like to uh, introduce. Specifically, chapter five will describe. Uh, the core concepts that characterize the doctrinal corpus of uh, Neurasianism. Uh, as we already said, Neurasianism is a dogmatic and normative philosophy that believes to represent the hermeneutic tool to unfold and interpret the world from an 
idiosyncratic perspective with the contraposition between actors in a dialectic perspective. And as an ideology, it is based on a constructivist analysis if we want, or best to say a synthesis between realism and constructivism. This is really subtle and I will come uh, with this later more. A, a, contrast, a constructivist analysis some, that somewhat re-echoes also Samuel Huntington's uh, theoretical paradigm based on civilizational struggle, although Neurasianism, as we will see, wants to create a peaceful international order and a coexistence among all civilizations. And uh, the idea is that different civilizations exist. So Eurasianism wants to sponsor civilizational identity and the creation of poles of identity and of civilization. Um, Civilizations are interpreted as organic wholes with their own identity and way to understand history, religion, politics, culture, and strategy. Of course, the conservative and traditionalist aspects of Neurasianism as a philosophical political doctrine will be highlighted. And also we will find a connection between national Bolshevism and uh, Neurasianism. At the same time, we will underlight the main aspects of the fourth of the, the fourth political theory that Dugan theorizes. Why fourth? Because it basically overcomes the three classical political theories of liberalism, Marxism, and fascism. We will see how and what it takes from all of them and what it rejects from, from all. Very interesting synthesis. And then, of course, we will understand um, how Eurasianist culturology contrasts uh, what it considers the cultural racism actually of Atlanticism and of the post-liberal West based on the alleged Western civilizational superiority. <coughs> of course, we will underline how Eurasianism is influenced by uh, a hermeneutical approach based on geopolitics, but also on an ideological closeness to philosophers like Carl Schmitt and Martin Heidegger, uh, the will to implement a worldwide conservative revolution and also to structure a civilizational Feldanschauung based on civilizational identity. And also the uh, leitmotif on the struggle between the civilization of the land and the civilization of the sea. Then we will also highlight the importance of the so called manifesto of the Global Revolutionary Alliance that Dugan promoted, which basically states and points out the bullets. Of the Eurasian, of the Eurasianist political doctrine and of its goals and aims. So then we reach chapter six, which describes the main ideological and political antagonists of New Eurasianism, namely post-liberalism, Atlanticism, and unipolar globalism. We will analyze them one by one, uh, understanding why they are considered antagonists why they are a threat to human beings and to civilization, according to New Eurasianism, and what are the characteristics of postmodern men that New Eurasianism wants to uh, counter and wants to uh, contrast. This will imply also the analysis of what modernism is, what post-liberalism is, following also the uh, philosophical um, interpretation given by Descartes, but also by Immanuel Kant on subjectivism, on modernism, on liberalism, and in general on the idea of enlightenment for the purpose of individual, individual evolution. And then, of course, we will introduce an Atlanticism, both from an ideological and also strategic perspective with a short historical background uh, on when it appears and how. And finally, as I already anticipated, chapter seven, the last one, will examine the New Originist project for the construction of the so called multipolar global order. Now, according to Dugan, there is the intention to create a world based on multipolarity, 
the rediscover of Russian geopolitical mission, but also the geopolitical mission of other international actors on the establishment of integrated geoeconomic zones and big spaces divided into civilizational blocks. And this ideal multipolar world based on civilizational blocks would be a world based on cooperation between different peoples and civilizations for promoting peace and mutual prosperity on close partnership between American, European, and African and Asian countries. However, without any form of uh, abuse by this respective fear, spheres to interfere with other spheres. So each one sovereign in its own continent, in its own sphere of interests, without meddling, without interference, and so on. And especially without the need to impose one unique social, political, and cultural model on the rest of the world. This, in the neo-regionist mindset, would allow the creation of a peaceful world based on self-determination of nations. Also, neo-regionism questions, especially in the long term, both the existence of uh, nation, nation states and also the existence of one single uh, world order, world state, or uh, best to say, world system. Uh, in other words, the Westphalian state, that, that is, was born in 1648 after the Thirty Years' War, that basically gave birth to the modern state, the fully sovereign state, that state would be overcome, should be overcome by instead civilizational big blocks, big spaces, a concept that we will see is close to Carl Schmitt's theorization of cross realm of big space, and uh, which would start as an economic uh, integrated, highly integrated area, a little bit like the European Union is, and it would then lead to the political union of a uh, self-sustaining and uh, self-determined political bloc. And uh, finally, we will consider how the Eurasianist project seeks to introduce the so-called system of autonomies uh, within the state, within this, the macroeconomic zone, or best to say the macro-political economic zone, and how it would like to introduce also direct democracy. So this is the general description of the book uh, in the coming uh videos i will analyze one by one the sections of the various chapters if you're interested in these topics let me know uh, the book is available also online where, wherever you are in the world and uh, i am very 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 happy to have the opportunity to describe these things with you and to talk about these things with you with such a pleasant audience and I, at this point, hope to see you very soon uh, on my channel. Until then, take care and bye-bye.